Ben Gibson is a interesting fellow. You might have actually heard him before if you listened to the first episode of Movies in the Black because he is a member of the Un Inc. I met him as he was running a filmmaker space called Uvolution in Austin, Texas, which brought together filmmakers in a united space uh, where they had access to, through a membership, to filmmaking materials, filmmaking equipment, most importantly, a community of fellow creators. Ben is a super inspirational dude. He has done a lot in his career, in his life, and I'll let him talk about that a little bit in this podcast. Really what he does and he specializes in is mentoring and creating spaces for filmmakers and creatives in general to really thrive and make their artwork. His, his long-term goal is to experiment with universal basic income and see how we can really make the world a better place by allowing people to create uh, while removing barriers to entry. Movies in the Black is a podcast show dedicated to figuring out how to make movies and actually make a living doing it. We have a lot of different ways we're going about doing that. People that we're bringing onto the show to talk to you about how they're doing it, the lessons they've learned, whether or not they figured things out. I had the opportunity to sit down with Ben in person in Austin, Texas, so I wanted to take that opportunity and record this interview. I think we got to the bottom of a lot of really interesting stuff, so enjoy. So hi, Ben. Hey, what's up? Now we're in person instead of on the phone, and uh, no one could see it in the last podcast that you were on, but you were on top of a roof. Yeah, I was on top of the roof, on top of my house. Yes. Overlooking the land. Yeah, which would be really cool, but it was dark, so I just didn't use the video. <laughs> yeah, and the sun kept setting. Yeah, like that sun, getting darker and darker. it just like does that, you know? It just goes down eventually. <laughs> Every single day. Every day. It's almost like you could predict it. But. <laughs> um, yeah. but welcome back to the show again, and I spilled coffee. God. I, yeah, you're horrible at holding things. I'm bad at holding things. It's like, <laughs> I'm glad that I don't get paid to hold things because I would be bad at it. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm yeah. um, always happy to be part of it. Yeah, do you want to, uh, just for people that maybe haven't, didn't hear the first one, but I, I want this one to be a little bit more about you and your journey as a as a creator or facilitator for creators mm. um do you want to give me a ballpark like the really short snippet version that you can i'm, I'm interested to see you try to do this <laughs> yeah me too um no warning i just like laid that on you uh yeah well i guess i've uh, spent the last five years of my life dedicated to uh, finding a way to support people like me um who kind of have felt isolated lonely um, and who are coming from a place of um, intent to want to do something meaningful in the world. People trying to make an impact yeah. in some way. Right. Yeah. So before you were here with the unincubator, is mm. that, do you guys call it the unink or the unink? We call it the unink now. Okay. Yeah. So the unink, you were with Evolution. Yep. And that was evolved in quite a few different ways right yeah i did i did a, I, it went a lot of different directions in the early years yeah i i met you whenever it was a filmmaking space yeah yeah so that i mean for me specifically like it that was an interesting thing i've actually had a lot of people can you explain that a little bit because i had a lot of people ask me about that in other places thinking they kind of had similar ideas to do something like that in pittsburgh or even m more rural areas mm. um and i'm like i don't know if it's like a great business idea <laughs> uh, I, I know this guy who tried it and i don't know if it worked out so well for him so yeah. i mean like it worked out obviously in a way of like the people you met and mm. like the community you were able to build there but uh, financially financially yeah i don't know if it's a solid business idea yeah i mean it was i mean we it didn't make any money um but um i still consider it like one of the most successful things i've done as far as like um, helping people and actually seeing um, the dream come to life. So in that sense, yeah, it was pretty, it was successful. So explain what it, what it was for people that don't know. Oh, it was, uh, so Evolution, after a few iterations of what it was, became a filmmaker space. And here in Austin, we opened up a little office on Riverside. And uh, we filled it up with a bunch of film gear and computers and started building a little uh, community uh, membership-based uh, community uh, for filmmakers to come in and have full access, 24-hour access to the gear and the editing lab. And um, 
we charged very low membership to have so it could be accessible. And we got up to about 20 members and it was like this bustling, cool little thing that everybody still misses and talks about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was really cool. And there was my favorite part where like the little workshop slash like get together party things that would happen. Uh, Did you do that every weekend or was it like once a month? I forget. We did a skill sharing once a month where we would bring it. We called it a skill share and we just let them do whatever they wanted. And the filmmakers, let's do gear. And so they'd set up gear in the office and then we'd have a music outside and people would just collaborate on their projects and it was really cool yeah i think a lot of people are looking for that like that's the i mean community in general like Mm -hmm. anybody not even just artists but in Mm -hmm. general people are looking for community uh artists especially especially filmmakers because it's such a collaborative art form Mm -hmm. need some kind of sense of community and and place where they can meet other creators and and facilitate all of that you can't do it alone you You can't can't create a film alone no, well, I guess you could, you but like, could, but like, it's much better to do it with other people. Yeah. I mean, in, 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 in that it's better to find people that are better at you for each individual thing, which is something I preach a lot for like first time filmmakers, people trying to make feature films specifically. Mm-hmm. Don't try to do the whole thing yourself. Be the orchestrator, be the composer mm. and hire the right musicians for the right, you know, mm. I'm using a metaphor, hire the right, right people for the right pieces. And also, I mean, a big part of your first film or your first project is minimizing the amount of people. So like when we did Blood on the Leaves, our whole thing was how few people can we get away with having on set and still make a professional looking movie. Mm. And that ended up being like six people total. Um, mm. An assistant director to keep everything like assistant director script. You, you just end up people wear multiple hats Mm. so everyone's still wearing multiple hats but like a it would be impossible to do that by yourself i loved i loved jumping into the film projects yeah i did i did never at quite the size that you did but i was always involved in you know small scale video production you did more a little bit more like um you did some music videos music videos and like uh did you do any commercial stuff uh well we did a little work for small businesses around in austin we did a few projects that was kind of a direction i was thinking about going is getting into more film production but it wasn't it yeah where i wanted to go was was there a reason that you decided that wasn't what you were doing um just because it wasn't as focused on the people as i wanted to be so i've constantly being tugged back to like focus on more of the individual like what does the individual dreamer need what what can i do with them specifically to help them grow right as opposed to like go make a, a video for a business to make money. You know? It's yeah. not as personal. Well, that's, yeah, that's what's like, exciting to me. The The money thing is like an indirect way to get to the personal development. Mm. Um, and what you're doing here with the, the Unink is like trying to drop the other side of it, like drop the expenses side, mm-hmm. make it possible. Obviously, that's like the vision, right? It's like right. to... Go ahead and elaborate on that. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just uh, the vision is to create a space, um, which was coined the Ink U space by the, some UT students who've been helping us kind of refine our methodology and how we approach and help people. Um, but yeah, we want to lower the barriers that are holding creatives back, and kind of because uh, we've seen it work in different in different ways that we've tried to try to implement this process in the past. And uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing out here on the Nine Acres. We want to provide affordable housing, affordable workspace, affordable resources, because we think uh, finances are kind of a, one of the biggest hindrances to creative, being able to plunge and go all in to creating. Yeah, definitely. That's, I mean, being able to minimize your expenses is better than making more money is mm. basically like the, and... Especially in the beginning. But it's not, po- especially if you're in a metropolitan area, the, those opportunities don't necessarily exist so i think it's a cool thing that what you guys are doing is like trying to create that yeah i I can't wait to see what happens when we can see uh see a creative spending maybe 15 hours a week working uh to sustain everything they need and just to spend the rest of their time working on their what they love to do and create creating what they need to create yeah yeah and not not i mean everyone's going to be struggling at that point right but it's kind of part of the like the being a beginning artist is Mm. that struggle, but not struggling to the point where it's going to break you or give up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's happens a lot. There's so many, so many talented filmmakers, 
or painters that I know, especially in like fine art and dance. I know a lot of dancers are the same way. You just get broken eventually. Uh-huh. And it's like oh, they, they have so much that they could add to the world mm. uh, in, in real value, but they just couldn't figure out how to make it work, which is why I'm like really into the business side of things. I'm like, how can I help myself figure the business side out so I can make art and make mm. uh, statements and yeah. and make it sustainable but also then how can i replicate that in a way i do it i use myself as a guinea pig mm, <laughs> a yeah. lot which i feel like you do that too you kind of mm-hmm. test stuff out on yourself and then you're for like sure. oh this worked oh like, for like, sure yeah mm. um your evolution oh it was the was the journaling thing part of evolution at yeah point? it was the i launched evolution uh five years ago with a, a product line called the upac so i designed a messenger bag a journal a little manual on how to chase your dreams uh, when I first started, and yeah, I, I, that was what I, that's what I launched with was that product line in the journal, wasn't it? How did that do? It was did... a huge failure. <laughs> I think I, I think I, I feel I, like because I feel like now the like personal like the the personalized journaling thing is like a huge market. Mm. You might have been too early on that though, or didn't know how to market yourself well enough. That might have been. Yeah, we're 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 trying again with a different version. Yeah. With this uninked life stuff. But, um, yeah, like guided journaling is definitely, mm-hmm. and it's helpful. It's a really genuinely useful practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were talking earlier today, like how much mm. journaling helps us, like, stay on track. Yeah, for um, sure. And, like, you do the morning journaling a lot. Yep. Which, like, what, what do you do when you, when you, do you have a method for that or you just kind of, um, I usually just uh, spend time reflecting on, I, I usually just ask myself, what does my heart want to say mm. in the mornings? And then when I wake up, like, what does my heart want to say? And that's when I start letting it come out. And uh, it's usually about my journey. It's usually about my life and experiences and across the board about everything. Yeah. Just reflecting on all of it, trying to make sense of this complicated um, <laughs> world we live in. Existence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the whole, the, yeah, the whole thing is complicated. Yeah. That's what, like, I get a lot of filmmakers, specifically filmmakers, uh, that reach out to me and they'll ask. Basically, they want me to solve all of their problems in one sentence. They're like, mm. give me the secret. And I'm like, I don't freaking know. Like, <laughs> I have no clue. Like, I mean, I can give you some po- general pointers. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I'm I'm in a place now where I'm pretty happy I've made a movie that at least made its money back, made some tiny bit of money off of it. Um, definitely I'm at a point where I can turn that into a repeat, repeatable process. Um, and that's what I'm working on now. So yeah, there is, I can help, mm. but not that much. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not going to solve, and I'm not going to make your movie for you either. That's like a big thing. It's like, people are like, I don't know if you saw this. I, I'm actually interested that like how, like what percentage of the filmmakers that were in that filmmaker space, like, do you feel actually saw through a lot of the projects they were working on? Mm. Just, I feel like that's with creators in general. That's yeah, I don't know what I'd the say, issue is there, uh, but I'd say three out of every ten. So like thirty percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would actually finish a project, mm-hmm. see it through to the end. Um, and where I was like, I, and I remember like because I was acting as the like some sort of like I knew what the hell I was talking about, but I was acting as some sort of like consultant to these filmmakers, yeah, like helping right. them get started. Yeah, and uh, all I did was like go to art school for a couple of years and did, opened it up and. Uh, it was interesting to 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 see how hungry they were for to create it to create something without any sort of script or anything yet. And at that stage, I'd already learned, well, you need to at least write something, right? Like you need to put it down on paper. But just trying to get them to do that was it was too much to to see them move forward. Yeah, um, yeah. Like they couldn't even get their ideas on, onto a script. So I'd be like. Go write a script and then come back to me and let's talk about the next steps. They would never. Yeah, even no, I get that. <laughs> I get that all the time. I literally have people Facebook message me. Writers, I, I there's a there's a few different writers that I think are great writers. They write either short stories or there's a couple, uh, two different novelists that like. One is like she's she's like crazy successful writer, mm. um, and she's been like, oh, I want to turn this into a movie, and I'm like, I okay, well, what's what's the synopsis? at minimum yeah. before I even consider it. Like, yeah, exactly. She's like, and it blows my mind like that it's difficult for them to put that into, I get it, but that's like, that's 
part of the work Mm -hmm. is like if you want to make a movie out of your story you have to if you're going to get other people involved something you have to like at the very minimum have a log line and a synopsis and i've seen filmmakers who like write like not even script format you know like on a word document they will at least put something down yeah and then i will help them even produce that right and it's not a perfect script and you know what we finished no, the project a, but, by that but you need that. a general direction pre-production is such a huge portion of the filmmaking process and i mean any any real filmmaker knows this mm. uh but i think it's a big it's not glamorous it's not sexy it's like mm. it's not pressing record on the camera it's the like sitting with an excel spreadsheet planning mm. out the shoots and stuff like that, which I geek out on. Like that's why I'm a producer mm. mostly. Uh, I but it, but if you're trying to do stuff yourself, then you got to learn how to do all that stuff too. So mm. either you have to learn how to do all that stuff yourself, or you have to figure out how to sell your ideas. And I don't mean sell as and get someone to buy it, but sell as and like convince someone mm. on your idea mm. uh, that does have those skill sets. But yeah. if you if you can't come to them with something written down, like what are they? As a filmmaker, put yourself yourself in like my, me and Ben's shoes here. Like you come to me and you say, I have an idea for a movie and I want you to help me make it. Okay. Well, what's it about? Well, I don't really like, well, hold on. And then you like explain Mm. some really convoluted thing and it's like, (laughs) you got to understand why that doesn't seem appealing to me. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, and I had, I do, and I still do have such a heart for even the people who don't have a script. Like I have a heart for like. I just it, find it the, pains the confidence it pains it, me because know? I want to I yeah, yeah I think that's where you are better at like yeah I'm kind of like figure it out and come back mm. you're you're much better at guiding people through yeah. that process which is yeah. like your whole thing mm-hmm. like um which is good maybe next time someone does that I'm gonna send them to you yeah <laughs> <laughs> so my way I love I love uh, being a part of that stage because it's so um, undermined I think like if even if it is three out of ten people like I said or whatever. Like, it's still critically important to somebody's growth that in those stages of not knowing what the fuck you're doing, that you have a, you have some you have somebody or a group of people to help you see that idea through. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Otherwise, it but may so not need, happen. <laughs> you need to surround yourself with people that I always say, like, surround yourself with people that are better than you at ever, like all of the other jobs. Mm-hmm. If you like, that's what happened with. I don't know if you're if, if you're familiar with like the story of how Quentin Tarantino got started. Mm, a little bit. And like his for Reservoir Dogs, like he had no idea what he was doing. But what the studio did, they saw that he was a like he had this crazy like creativity about him, and they. Which it wasn't a big studio; it was a small studio that gave him the money. Um, or actually, it might have even been like an individual producer that gave him the money. But uh, they surrounded him with like Oscar-winning cinematographers and like producers and AD. Like everybody else on set was like a pro crew, and he was the only amateur. <laughs> and it was they were basically like that's so cool. Okay, and, and that's how a lot what of a dream director, come true. Right? I know, right? That's how a lot of directors got their start, though, and it's like. I would love to set that up for more people. Like, I would love to go to a place where I can set that up for new directors. Like, um, yeah. but they've also got to at least have shown like the follow through first that like they're not going to choke in that situation because there's a lot of money that gets involved. Yeah, there. I wonder like, what I wonder what Quentin's uh, what he did like to get. So it, yeah, like he did, wrote a lot before wrote. that. Yeah, okay. so he he was no he was already he had worked. I think it was Paramount that he wrote for. Mm-hmm. So like they knew it, like. Everyone in the studio already knew him. So, like, mm-hmm. he had built those relationships. So they trusted that. So even if you're not making your film right away, like, mm-hmm. all the interactions you're having speak to your character and speak to, do you get shit done? Yeah. That just mat- that I can't yeah. get over how much getting shit done matters. Yeah, like, yeah. it doesn't even have to be good. Yeah. But getting it done yeah. is, like... And, and, and why would you not want to, like, as a creator? Like, maybe you can speak to that because you've, like talked so in depth with so many of these is it because they're trying to seek perfection or is it they why they won't see it through yeah like how, mm-hmm. what what are some of the the catch-ups that yeah. uh, keep people from finishing these projects i feel like it's a um i feel like it's a, a lack of self-confidence i feel like that's the mm. i think that's the, the root of it and uh, i and i've and I thought about this so much i thought about this so like if it's the lack of self-confidence that keeps people from to move forward towards their dreams then then what is it that they're missing and i used to think that it was like you needed a healthy ego 
right? That maybe you needed to go to the gym and uh, boost your ego a little bit so you could find self-confidence. But over time, I've learned even through my own personal journey that it's not about ego. It's more about humility and that the opposite of um, lack of self-confidence is just learning how to be more humble and about what you're creating and more honest with yourself and those around you. And it's more powerful that way too when you are. So that's really interesting and like seems counterintuitive but it makes sense you're right yeah it told when it when in it was a mentor that was kind of talking me through that idea but when he said it, i was like Whoa, wow i've been missing this for a long time yeah well because at that point it, the i think the self-confidence thing catches people up because i've been through this earlier in my in my creative career i was not a very self-confident confident person and my i would not finish things a mm. lot and I think the thing that caught me up was like, for some reason, I thought that the me of the project, me in the project mattered somehow, mm. but it doesn't really. Mm -hmm. it's, like it's the art is its own thing and you're just kind of supposed to be shepherding it. Yes. And it's like yeah. taking your ego out of the art allows you to have that freedom to uh, allow the art to live mm -hmm. and not have anything to do with whether you like yourself as a person or mm -hmm. you like all of those things or you feel like you can really execute it. Like mm. it just starts to fall into place once you let go. And also like, then you are more likely to allow other people to give you help. Mm -hmm. That's a thing too, is like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like a lot of uh, creatives like don't want other people to help them because they feel like that's it's losing gonna, because it's mm -hmm. no longer their ego project. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, really, it's a humbling experience when you're first starting, you know, like to write your first script. Yeah. to put your first it really beats out there. you up hey, yeah, yeah it's like it's hard it's hard to do that and that's why so few of them yeah get through it that's, so. th that's why there's like a barrier that's that is there's such a huge barrier to entry especially in video because there's mm. just so many moving parts yeah it's so intimidating and i don't know i just believe sometimes if a person can't find um what they need to create that if if somebody can grant that to them that that is sometimes enough to take the first steps and to learn a little bit of that confidence that they need. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you, you take the, and I think what you're doing here is is getting towards that, is you're taking, so like let's say you have a certain amount of self-confidence in, in the work that you're doing uh, or towards like your ability to do the work. And, but then you're waiting tables and like you're not really sure about your living situation mm. and like, like groceries just maxed out your credit card like yeah. and like all of that stuff really beats you down yeah um and i mean in serving serving tables or working in retail or, is such a soul crushing job because mm -hmm. people don't treat you like you're a human and then how are you supposed to then turn around and like be a, like mm -hmm. treat yourself like a human when mm -hmm. all you're hearing all day is like this negative talk towards you then you're gonna have this negative self-talk and that's being able to escape that, I mean, for anyone, not just creatives, but just for anyone, I just mm. feel like not everyone feels that way about serving. And obviously, like more established um, restaurants and stuff, it's different, like higher end things. But like the general thing, I remember like bussing tables in Pittsburgh and mm. like going home and like crying because mm. I was like, I don't feel like. I'm a human. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It's, it's rough. It is, it can be rough. Um, if you had, also where you grow. Yeah. You know? If you had advice for someone that's kind of in that right now, you know, they don't have access to something like you're trying to build with Unink. Mm. Um, if you would act, if you would advice for someone like that, that's kind of their life is so stressful that they feel like I can't make this art. I want to, like, it's deep in their soul that they want to, but they just can't do it because they feel like they can't do it because there's just so many other things in their life that's, like, weighing on them. Mm. What would that What would that advice look like? I would say, um, really, I mean, I said this quote, one of my favorite quotes is, like, if it doesn't come out of your soul like a rocket, if it doesn't come out of your soul like a rocket, don't do it. I think it's Bukowski. Is it mm, like mm -hmm. But um, just that when it... it I don't know. You have to like lower what, like let it come out. Yeah. Like let that rocket come out and, and you got to lower, what is it that's stopping you? Is it the noise? Is it the people? Is it your, your job? Is it change whatever you need to change in order to let that come out? Yeah. I think a lot of that, um, comes from fear. 
yeah. and expectation. And a lot of mm-hmm. fear comes from expectation because with expectation is then the fear of what if that expectation is not met. Mm. And if your only expectation is to make the thing mm-hmm. and then let it go, right. then like that's all in your control. Mm. But if the expectation is like, I'm going to make this thing and people are going to love it and it's going to change the world and like mm. all this crazy stuff's going to happen because of this one piece of art that I make, mm-hmm. that's A, not realistic mm-hmm. <laughs> for most people. Yeah. Uh, unless you're, I mean, really, even like Picasso made like 600 some pieces during his most successful period and only like five of them are really considered like masterpieces. Yeah. It's like, just got to make this stuff. Mm. Um, it's such a hard like i get it that it's hard to like it seems like such like it's like that advice is stupid that's Mm -hmm. like just too easy Mm -hmm. but yeah like lowering that barrier of like what are the what are you afraid of lowering those expectations yeah well giving yourself permission to like try stuff mm -hmm. and fail yeah i mean yeah it's been one of the biggest catalysts for me to start evolution was my hometown of andrews which i'm going to be starting a podcast around because of that um, and I want, I want to kind of highlight what that means in culture and in, 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 in the culture specifically there in Andrews, but also it's probably everywhere that keeps people from pursuing. What are those expectations? Like you're saying that that's keeping them from chasing that piece of work that they want to create or even, yeah, I mean, and this even applies to things outside of the art world, right? Like mm-hmm. what, what's keeping you from talking to that man or woman? Mm-hmm. that you're into mm. or what's keeping you from right. telling that person that you're really into them right mm. what's keeping you from to trying to take the new job or like quit your job and, and start your own business or like mm-hmm. what there's all kinds of things where and so much of it is at least from my perspective comes from the, the expectations mm-hmm. and it's like when you go into things without any expectations mm-hmm. like you can plan but know that like the universe is going to punch you across the face a couple times <laughs> and like you got to kind of just love that process like yeah even if it's in regards to like relationships like you got to be like that's all right that's kind of funny you know yeah. like kind of laugh it off and it takes that's where that resiliency i think that's what that grit comes from but like you're not going to develop that grit unless you go out and take some punches mm-hmm. it's not for everybody yeah that's true so we're talking about the majority of people won't the majority of people won't do it. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it's, it's definitely, I think the idea though of a, I think the idea that a lot of people are fooled by is the idea of stability, the idea of a stable Mm. job. Yeah. Um, like the idea that working for one company for a certain given amount of time or something, getting a quote unquote good job, is going to give you job security, security in general. Like, all you're doing is putting your, like, the potential for failure in someone else's hands, which I guess is freeing in Mm -hmm. some ways. If you don't want that responsibility, you're putting it in some other business owner's hands. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, that business could go out of business. Your job could get laid, you could get laid off. Like, Mm -hmm. all kinds, and I mean, that's not just like a, minor thing like lots of people have had their lives just destroyed and andrews i'm sure is a a town that like is affected pretty Mm -hmm. heavily by that where i'm from there's like steel and uh pressed metals it's big um all of the industry basically it's like these people thought oh i'm i can go work this job have security but i'm seeing it now in white collar work too like i'm gonna go work for this uh ad agency and i'm gonna work there Mm -hmm. for a long time and be stable and and secure uh, but then things change. Then you're stuck without having developed any new skills the yeah. last 20, 30 years. And then you're really in trouble. And it's like, I, I know that most people are not going to take any of this advice. <laughs> most yeah. people are just going to be like, I just want to be comfortable. Mm-hmm. But it's like, I really am concerned for those people because I don't think that that comfort is real i'm like it's so fragile Mm. and you're not building the skills that you need to be resilient when life does punch you across the face because it's going to if you're really lucky maybe it won't (laughs) but i know very few people that have never had a big upset in their life at some point Mm. and if it hasn't happened to you yet 
it's coming. You better look out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, um, I think over the past years of, you know, having struggled so many times with different businesses and running across financial difficulty, it's kind of dawned on me that it's all like an illusion that the fear of it not working out is an illusion. Obviously shit doesn't work out, but I'm sp- talking like specifically about like finances. Yeah. And in my experience the past years, it's like something always happens if you just take the next step and you just keep believing in what you're going to do. Something always works out. And it's gotten to the point where I've like moved through that pain and fear so many times that it's easier now for me to be like, I don't know how the fuck we're going to pay these bills. I have no idea where the money's going to come from. But something always happens. Always. Yeah. As long as you I don't keep, know how. As long why. as you keep putting the work in and trying new things, like yeah. something is going to click. And you can't teach that. You yeah. can't just sit here and tell somebody that. Right. You, you ha- a person has to go through and experience that to actually You're, learn that faith. Yeah. Unfortunately, it is like a personality thing too. There's definitely personalities of people that just don't have the tolerance for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it sucks. It's not comfortable. It's really uncomfortable (laughs) you know yeah like i think it applies a lot to filmmakers though because Mm. a lot of filmmakers will find a lot of excuses not to make their stuff Mm. or use those excuses to not be real with why the stuff they did make didn't work out Mm. they didn't make money off of it whatever um and it's if you want to make a living as a filmmaker or a creative of any kind you got to be you have to take a really serious look at yourself and say, like, first of all, my biggest advice is make more stuff. Like, you're never going to know what stuff resonates with an audience unless you're just making stuff all the time. If you're a filmmaker and you're really if that's your sole thing, at least make a film a year. I don't care if it's just you. We just mm-hmm. said you can't make a film by yourself. I don't care if you try to make a film by yourself. Put it out on Amazon Prime because anybody can do that. And collect tiny, tiny little royalty checks from it. Do mm-hmm. that every year for the next 10 years and all of a sudden. And you're going to get better each time too. And you're going to see, okay, this one resonated with people. This one didn't. You kind of find that balance between what resonates with you as an artist and what resonates with your audience. And you can only really tell that by putting it out and seeing. You can't predict it. You can't yeah. sit here and think about it for 10 years be like, well, I think they're going to like this, and I think they're going to like this, and I mm. think people are going to be into this. Uh, eventually, the only way to get that information is to actually put yourself out there and like try it in business or in filmmaking. Filmmaking is just a business. That's all. Like, yeah. I, I, artists hate hearing that, mm. <laughs> but it really, like, you're just art is a product. It's so much more than that. But when you're talking about making a living, it's a product. You know, that's something I've been thinking about just like this week and last week. I'm thinking how much, I don't know, I hate even though I feel like which I hate even hearing it come out of my mouth. But yeah. like how much expression and like art and isn't enough, you know, like it's not enough to make like the There's living so- or the money you want to make. There's you know, so like, many like, great artists that are never going to make a living because they just aren't. Honestly, most of them just aren't making enough stuff. Mm. Like like that example with Picasso. I read this book, um, David and Goliath, by Malcolm Gladwell, and it kind of it blew my mind. It talked a lot about how well. Oh, and 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 also I read at the same time uh, originals by Adam Grant, and they both mm-hmm. kind of talk. They actually use the same example of Picasso in it. Yeah. Um, but it talks a lot about how. Almost all of the really successful artists that you can look up to, and these are the people that genuinely have artistic expression and impact, right? Mm -hmm. Like Stanley Kubrick, for example. Like Stanley Kubrick had so much impact, not only in the film world, but on the world in general. Like the ideas that he was able to share and get across through his filmmaking genuinely changed the like consciousness of the society we live in. Mm. And he only did that because early on he was making so much – like back when he was a photographer and doing documentary work, most people don't know this. He was just making stuff constantly. And then he made a couple little short documentaries and then he made a, a short film by himself, like a war film in Central Park in, in New York with hmm. him and his friends. And like that was enough to 
then he was very strategic about he took Spartacus because Spartacus uh, would allow him to have some clout in the, in the studio world, which obviously that none of that is really relevant anymore. But the idea was like he never compromised his artistic vision, but he also was constantly thinking, how does this play out in my in the business of my career? Mm. You don't they don't have to be mutually exclusive. You don't have to just be an artist and not worry about the business or just focus on the business and not get to like have artist artistic expression. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's what I've been thinking a lot. It's like, it's so important how you deliver it, whatever it is you're creating, like how you get people's attention, how you get people to buy it, how you get people to care about what you're doing is yeah. a, the other side of it. That's well, it's, and it's honestly, er, honestly, it, early but. on too, like, and this is like real tough love stuff. Uh, and I wish more people would have told me this early on is like, you're probably not as good as you think you are. <laughs> like your work might just not be that good. Like, like you might yeah. have really good. I think a lot of people have really great ideas, but like, they don't have, like, you're not going to learn the skills to really execute on it. until you just start making stuff and like doing stuff that's not good. Yeah. It's really great to like go back and look at a filmmaker's first film. Mm hmm. Like the one that they don't really have released anymore. Like if you can find it on YouTube and stuff. Like yeah. look at Chris Nolan's like short films from high or from college. Yeah, uh, it's just like oh okay yeah they totally started out in the same place. The difference is they kept pushing forward and they were very self aware about how to get better mm -hmm. and keep getting better constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean they still do it. Like you look at Spielberg and like Christopher Nolan and Stanley Kubrick like they reached a peak at some point of like no one expected them to keep getting better. Mm -hmm. Like they had already mastered their craft and they, instead of being like, okay, well now I'm just going to, you know, work at that level. They continue to push themselves and try to craft an even better pro, like a better film, a better piece of art. So it, there is something to that of like the artistic expression is enough if the art you're making is so amazing, but you got to be self-aware enough to realize that's not going to happen for the first 10, 20 years of doing the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. There's, there's a bunch of different complicated pieces of it. Yeah. And yeah, I might be completely incorrect, but that's just what I've been thinking about lately with what we're doing. And well, it's, it's been, it's important to give it. Uh, and I think maybe this is something that you can consider for yourself, like mm -hmm. is giving opportunities for, artists to have access to the business side education mm -hmm. because they just don't like when you go to art school you, they don't teach you that stuff yeah it's so stupid that they don't but like mm -hmm. they don't and i feel like there's lots of artists out there yeah there's plenty of artists that you're never going to convince that that's that matters mm -hmm. but there's lots of artists out there that know it matters and just don't can't figure it out you know mm -hmm. they don't have the resources it's so like workshops and like coaching and things like that totally mm -hmm. are in line with helping them understand that side of the business and develop their business plan mm -hmm. as an artist, which I know you, you've done quite a bit of that, but yeah, I don't know. I don't, but you don't yeah. necessarily have all the answers. No one's going to give you all the answers. Yeah. Like, I don't think you can take any amount of classes or <laughs> workshops to like learn enough yeah, to, to it's just got to be like, it's got to build a successful business. I think it's got to do it. You have to do it. <laughs> like, yep. And, and I mean, it's tying in exactly what we're trying to do here, you know, just providing that space for people to actually go fuck it up and yeah. go do it. And providing the ability the to fail. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And not like die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ben. Thank you. That's a good, that's a good way to end it. Okay. <laughs> uh, is there uh where, where can people check out you um, personally? And uh, then, like, let me see. I they like can, your 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 Instagram's a yeah. good a good place. Yeah, just um, uh, check out my Instagram, Uvolution, and then Onink is onink dot com. The onink dot com. Yeah, and I mess that Austin, up all the time. It's alright. <laughs> Theonink dot com. If you're ever in Austin, we'd love to have them out. Yeah, check out what we're doing out here. Yeah, I think it, uh, it's pretty easy to. You have like Google listening. Every, if you Google, mm -hmm. you the can Google Inc. the Onink. It'll uh, give bring you the right address here. and yeah, it it it. It's not that far out of the city. It's what, 15, 20 minutes yeah. drive? Yep. Um, and then, yeah, it's a really sweet place. <laughs> so totally come check it out. And thank you, Ben. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, bye. Thank you for listening to that episode of Movies in the Black. I really hope you found that useful. 
I sure enjoyed that conversation. <laughs> um, if you are enjoying this show, which I don't know why you would have listened to the end of this show if you didn't enjoy it, please give us a rating on iTunes. If you're not listening on iTunes, go ahead and, and give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Wherever you're listening, please give us some kind of feedback. It's really helpful. It helps get the word out to other people that might be interested in this content. And it helps us uh, know whether or not we're doing well. So, And if you ever want to send me an individual message, you can always go to moviesintheblack.com. You can check out the stuff there, including blog posts that are not part of this show. Um, and you can find my email there where you can email me with individual things. Thank you for watching, and I really hope to see you in the next episode, or at least uh, I hope you hear me in the next episode. I guess I won't see any of you, but you know what I mean. All right, bye.